Hey everyone. Hello, hello. I think there's like about a 10 second delay from when I talk and when you guys see me. So give me a heads up when you see me here. I see some people are already here. Hi everybody. South of England, Kansas City, Baltimore. Where else is everybody coming from? Nice to see you all here. West Michigan, high desert, Albuquerque. Massachusetts, North Carolina, Kansas, St. Louis, Vermont, Michigan. Hi everyone, it's so nice to see you all. Missouri, thank you for coming. Um, I hope everybody had like a fabulous holiday and a really good New Year's Eve. Mine was fabulous. I was just saying to Mr. Much More Patient last night that the year that I, I just looked outside and realized the tree has broken off at the top. Wonder when that happened. Anyway, it's in the woods, so it's okay. I was just telling Mr. More Patient last night that the year that I decided to like not even pretend to try to do anything on New Year's, like we used to get together with people just in the neighborhood and stuff. And sometimes that was fun. But when we just kind of decided we were just going to cook a nice dinner at home and like go to bed at a normal time, my life got better. <laughs> I, I really enjoy the not doing anything for New Year thing. Well, as people come in here, I thought I would just say hello again. California. Oh, my goodness, Diane, you are up early. Thank you for coming. Ontario. Heather's my name. She's. She's my neighbor here in southeastern Wisconsin, which is, Heather would tell you, as will I, uncharacteristic. I think it's cooler today, but it's just been, well, I think a lot of people have been having uncharacteristically warm weather, at least here in the Midwest. Um, in fact, I filmed a garden tour uh, two days ago that I'll probably have, that I'll have up this week for you, which if I've ever done a, well, I've certainly never done a December garden tour. If I've ever done a winter garden tour, it's, well, I have done a couple of those when it's fully in snow, but there's actually like plants still looking okay out there. It's insane. The ground is not frozen here. Oh, the mug is just coffee. You guys, my favorite great Dixter mug. Uh, we, maybe we'll talk about these mugs uh, later, but I brought all the, I bought, I have everything ready to go for a New Year's Day Bloody Mary but it's too early right now. <laughs> I can't, I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound good to me right now. So I probably will have one of those, but not right now because that doesn't sound great. So I want to hear, hi everybody, as you're coming in, Appleton, South Carolina, Milwaukee. Um, yeah, Emma says, last year there was a huge snowstorm. Now this year the ground is not frozen. It's just crazy. Um, Georgia. Oh, John saw daffodils coming up. Speaking of things coming up, I was rooting around in the garden. I have buds coming on hellebores. Now, in some places, that's totally normal. I have never seen hell. I, I think usually my hellebores bloom in like April, not even March. It's shocking to me that I'm seeing that stuff. Unbelievable. Warmer than normal in the UK too. And what, didn't you guys have, I thought there was a lot of rain over there or is that only sort of in part of, um, part of the UK there? Sandra's garlic is going crazy. I have not checked on mine yet. I should get out there and check on mine. I should have done that during that tour. I have not looked at it lately. Well, anyway, um, thank you as you're all coming in. Happy new year again, if we haven't said hi yet. Um, leave some comments for me. If you guys have gardening questions, or whatever. But what I really would love to know is like, what are your thoughts for what you're thinking about doing in your garden this year? I'm not really, I don't set, um, I don't make resolutions. It's just not a thing I do. I haven't found that to be particularly successful for me. And I don't even really set goals. My brain, uh, but I do sort of, you know, think about things that I want to want to do. So I never get into like terminology with that because I don't know. Feel like it's too much commitment or something um rhode island is now a zone 7a is that nuts or what 
That's crazy. Yeah, we're going to start seeing gardenias and cam camellias in Rhode Island. That is just crazy. Oh, Sean is in Trinidad. Well, you win. Um, okay, so I'm going to start, start throwing in some of these here because I can show some of your comments here. Hang on. Now you guys are going fast. Coleus. John's using lots of coleus there to fill in gaps. It's such a good filler. Here's Vicky gonna make some new beds with her half moon edger. Um, this, right? This is what you do, right? You gotta see like, so many of my gardens have have come to be because I looked at a space and then been, oh, something should be there, and then it kind of just flows flows from there. Oh, well, this is a great way to do it. Have somebody come in and do the the ripping out and the making beds. That's that's great. Um, yep. I tell you what, the more I've been growing snapdragons, the more I realize that they are such good plants, especially I think up here in the cooler zones, because for me, they will grow from, oh gosh, I mean, May. May, oh, maybe May might be pushing it, but they're probably blooming certainly in early June, um, maybe May, and they will go all the way to frost and they will sort of lull out for me kind of in like August. And that's about it. Otherwise, those things are blooming. It's the same plants. They just sort of cease blooming for a little bit. I mean, it is such, I grow them mostly in the raised bed garden where I have my cutting, some of my cutting flowers, but that's a big, that's a big deal. Oh, you're taking out rubber mulch and weed fabric. Everyone, send Lori your good vibes because she's going to need it. That's a tough job. Um, this is exactly, Dindy, this is how the vast majority of my garden was made, ash trees falling down. And um, the big garden that I have out by the road, which I did in 2020, that entirely happened because I'm just looking at this. I have this like chunk of hair that never wants to hang out with the rest of my hair and it always drives me nuts um that ash tree an ash tree fell down it was huge and very quickly that just turned into a weedy mess so it was unbelievable to me so quickly um oh hi libby okay this is a great question so here's I do have a bunch of videos and some blog posts about this, but but generally speaking, if you're just starting seeds for the first time, I mean, I don't think you should invest in a ton of stuff because you want to make sure that this is something you enjoy doing and you're going to be into it before you really invest in a ton of stuff. Just invest in a light. You're going to need a light to have any reasonable amount of success. So invest in a light. There are some, uh, my mom uses some nice little tabletop systems. They might be from Gardener Supply and they have a couple of brackets and you can raise and lower a little LED light. It's enough for probably one tray or maybe two trays under it if you set them sideways. Um, so get yourself a light. Don't skimp on that. Um, you need, I mean, you don't necessarily need a heat mat. A heat mat really can help but if you find a warm spot like even on top of a refrigerator um, a radiator might be too warm a little bit of bottom heat helps so if you can figure out a way to get bottom heat without having to buy a heat mat um, that's good you just have to kind of pay attention to the germination temperature that seeds want um, those are the main things get yourself some trays you can probably reuse something um, you know the size of cells or pots or whatever that you start in is kind of the key because you don't want them so big that they get overwatered. You don't want to, that's why we don't start in like four inch pots with that one little seed because it's just way too easy to overwater. It's very, very difficult to control the watering in that. It's very easy for them to rot. So that's why we start in smaller containers and then gradually bump plants up. So, um, but you can, if you just have a flat tray, even, um, I mean, 
listen, seed starting is where you can get really creative with stuff. Um, like food containers to go containers, pop some holes in it and you can kind of, you know, you don't have to necessarily have cells. You can break them out into individual plants later on. So that's the basic. So the number one thing I would say, you just, just get a light because you're going to have so much, so much better luck with it. Um, I do not. The only, we have solar lights and that's all we have. You know, I don't, I don't know a lot about designing landscape lighting. And I think that it's one of those things that's really kind of an art. Um, so we have these, so the solar lights. Um, I made that path. They are still working. Um, they, they work all winter long, which is shocking to me. And we've been really happy with those. They point down, which is kind of important. Um, and they're just easy. So I don't have to go running um, lighting all over the place. Yeah, John says he got the lights from Gardner Supply where you can add more as they go. That's a nice, a nice idea. Um, absolutely, Clementus on a fence will work fine. Um, I mean, it depends a little bit on what kind of fence. They have to have something to grab onto and tendril up. So if it's a chain link fence, that should work. If it's, I mean, in a really hot area, sometimes metal can get too hot, not an issue that I've ever had. Um, if it's a stockade fence or something else, you're gonna have to provide a framework for it to climb up. I think um, Clematis need something um, like, you know, I think it's like pencil wide or, yeah, well you can do them on a chain link fence, so that will work. They will grab onto really like on strings and stuff, but, you're probably better off with um, really skinny bamboo or something. You do need to create some kind of framework for them to be able to twine it. If it just makes sure you're getting a twining variety and combining with climbing roses always, I mean, it's always a winner, but remember with climbing roses, you got to tie those in. So it's just a little bit of work of figuring out how to make them go the direction you want them to go, which is up. Yeah previous owner's plants. Yeah, that's, you know, everyone has their own tastes in plants and sometimes we inherit things. I mean, I think there's the only plants left that were here when we bought this house are the peonies. And I, I leave them here not because they're fabulous peonies, but they are the only peonies I have. And they're sort of an homage to what was here. They're just a basic, you know, kind of old fashioned variety, which is fine. Oh, this is a, this is a great idea. Container gardens are, are the ticket, right? Um, the full sun ideas for can containers, you know, um, take a look at what Jack Barnwell does. He's got that business C3 gardens down in Florida. Um, he has some really interesting container ideas. He relies obviously heavily on, um, tropicals. And I do think that you might be well served to get like a self watering container, which is not to say that you won't have to water it every day because you probably will have to fill that self-watering container every couple of days. But I think it might be easier than having to run out there with a hose because you could end up, you know, having to, you know, come out there with a hose twice a day and that's a drag. I have not grown in straw bales, um, but I mean, Listen, Craig LaHuyer, who is the garden, the tomato expert, wrote literally wrote the book, Epic Tomatoes, grew all his tomatoes and straw bales for, I think he still does to a certain extent, although he moved now, um, for years and years and years. It's, I think it's a fabulous way, fabulous way to grow. It's not just a matter of just sticking them in straw bales, though. You have to season the straw bales. Uh, my mom tried it last year and she didn't have great luck with it, but I don't think she got the hang of seasoning the straw bale right. So maybe it's one of those things that probably takes a couple of tries to get it right. Yeah, this is always a great option. Winter sowing and milk jugs. People absolutely love it. Um, I don't have a lot of success with it. So I just kind of stopped doing it. I don't, I don't know what my problem is. It hasn't been particularly successful for me. I do think part of it is that my spring is so late that that it's so late by the time I can, they, things are mature enough to get them out of winter sowing jugs that I really have far more advanced plants if I can start them inside. 
Okay, let's talk about man pest management, right? Okay. Um, oh, and I just need to mention that Sean says that giant African snails <laughs> kill my mom's dahlias. We're going to talk about that in a second. Okay, pest management, not including giant African snails. So I think I've told this story before. I've probably written blog posts about it. The the best thing that ever happened in my garden was, this is probably, this is over, well, gosh, this is probably 15 years ago now, maybe a little less. I got super busy one summer, and this was before I was making YouTube videos, probably before, maybe not before I was blogging, but it was earlier on in my gardening career. And I had been dealing with, like, every time I planted something, I felt like some bug was attacking it. And then one summer I just got really, really busy and I had a garden and I enjoyed the garden, but I wasn't in the garden every day. So I missed a lot of that day-to-day -day activity. And interestingly enough, I mean, some plants suffered obviously, but interestingly enough, what kind of happened was the whole ecosystem kind of reset itself. And I think that one summer that I didn't pay attention to my garden allowed, a lot of the good bugs that I had been inadvertently probably killing and harming or not inviting into my garden because there was no food for them. Because I was spraying, every time I'd see a bug, I was hitting it with a hose or getting it with insecticidal soap, or I didn't use a lot of chemical sprays, but I had some on hand and I would go to that if I, a couple days later, it was still there. So what happened that year that I sort of forgot about the garden was that everything got a little bit of reset I, everything just got better. So I don't have a ton of bug issues here. So here's where how I deal with pests now. So first of all, you got to, I mean, you got to identify the pest, just like any disease, whatever. You got to figure out what it is. And the internet is hugely helpful with this. And there's all sorts of ways you identify bug damage. Um, mostly, but Google will be a huge, be a huge help with this. There are also some really good books out there. So can always hit the library if you're feeling you know really ambitious about it so figure out what it is i don't ever recommend treating any pest without figuring out what it is first then unless it's something that's that's i'd never run into this but unless it's something that's i don't know absolutely terrible like a spotted lantern fly or something where you go the the instruction is oh there goes the light kill it immediately um unless it's something like that i wait and just wait and watch. If there's a ton of aphids, I'll wipe them off. But otherwise, I just wait. And then I come back in a couple of days and I keep an eye on it. And so because what happens is the good bugs and the birds and things like that in the garden will often come and take care of those problems without any issue. Sawfly larvae may be an exception to that. I find that sawfly larvae, which hit my roses pretty bad, can do a lot of damage by the time something finds it. I'm sure the birds get to it, but so I will squish those by hand. So that's sort of my first step. Then the next step would be looking into something you can apply. There's almost nothing you put on a plant that isn't to deal with a pest problem that isn't also going to hurt something else. So it's just, it's kind of that. Okay. I just want to put this out there. I don't know what that is, but I'm not interested in finding out what a giant African snail is. I have seen some pictures. I'm so glad I have this answer ready to go because it comes up every time I do a live. It's called Summer Nights by Benjamin Moore. It's sort of a deep blue with like a little bit of like there's a little teal bent in it maybe, but it definitely reads as like a blue. Um, yes, for sure. Honeysuckle would be a great one. Just make sure you're not buying one of the invasive honeysuckles. Uh, by one of the cultivated varieties. Dor Thank you for asking, Eleni. That's really nice of you. Uh, Dorothy's doing better. She's actually just in the last month or so, she's really perked up. We think she's been pretty sad. She's really perked up quite a bit. There's still some things like it's really weird. She won't, um, she won't come into the living room with us at night unless we like call her in there. Like, obviously, she's welcome in there anytime, but she'll just stay in the kitchen all the time unless we call her in there and we sit on the floor and just hang out with her. 
so anyway, thank you for asking. She's doing better. Um, she's hanging in there and yes, she's, she's really getting loved up by the neighbors. So she feels like she's pretty special. Oh, why garden? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I would assume John, we're talking elephant ears, not elephants. I'm not, um, I can't help you with elephants. Um, John, where are you? Um, Cause that's a little earlier than I would probably start them. Um, actually, John, let us know where you are. And then maybe Yulia can also weigh in on this cause she's sort of the elephant ear queen. Cause if you're closer in area than you are to her, than you are to me, um, that might be more helpful. Um, here we go. This is a good question. So when I started gardening, we moved here. I had been a big container gardener and we bought this house in part so that I would have a place to garden because I just was really getting into it. And I wanted, I wanted desperately to grow me. There was no more room at the apartment we were at. Well, also we just were sick of being in an apartment. So what I wanted was, I thought I had a vision for a garden. I was used to seeing my mom's garden or other gardens I had been to that looked finished. And here I was starting with pretty much a blank slate because we ripped out like a lot of what was here. Um, in fact, where the patio garden is now, where like the urn is in the garden, that kind of wraps around that side of the house. That was all a mix of ornamental grasses in a bed that was probably 12 feet, no, maybe 15 feet deep, um, all the way around. And they were horrible. They were horrible. They, a lot of them flopped anytime it rained, they'd be laying on the patio or laying all over. The woman who owned this house before used this as a cottage. Oh, sorry, you guys, this chunk of hair just drives me bananas. And so when I look at my face, all I see is the whatever, whatever, why it's revolting, I don't know. Anyway, um, I think the woman, she didn't want a garden, you know, so she had somebody put that, she wanted privacy on her patio, which is funny because I feel like it's super private out here anyway. It's a, no one comes out here so she wanted privacy so we lived with that for one year not even by fall we rented a brush mower we mowed it all down so getting back to the impatient gardener thing stand task Aaron. i saw this vision for what i wanted that garden to be that was the first garden i developed and my mom was super helpful to me she was totally my gardening mentor i really didn't know what i was doing and I just kept saying, I want it to look this because Aaron, you have to wait. It's not going to look like, like you just give it some time to grow. And I was so frustrated that I planted the plant and it didn't look great. And so I am in general, a fairly impatient person. I was super impatient when it came to gardening and I, I learned, you know, obviously uh, it's, it's supposed to be a little bit funny because I think if you've gardened for any amount of time, you know, that impatience and gardening are not necessarily something that exists, coexist well. So I, you know, named myself that. I still am impatient. I still have a hard time waiting. And is Mr. Much More Patient that much more patient? He used to be, but I know he's getting older now. I don't think he's as patient as he used to be. But yes, he's generally better tempered and more patient than I am. Um, there is a climbing rose that has... Is it William Baffin that doesn't have thorns? Somebody weigh in on that one because I know someone out there knows the answer to that. Um, so many plants that I have regretted. But um, Artemisia Oriental Limelight was an aggressive, horrible, terrible thug in my garden. I ripped it out of this garden easily 10 years ago. And every once in a while, I swear to God, I still find some. Um, same with a version of Coreopsis that, that was a pass along plant that seeded all over the place. I, in fact, in fact, I swore off Coreopsis for many years because I was so traumatized by that one really seedy variety of Coreopsis. It's, I mean, it's common name is tick seed. So a lot of times if seed is in the name of a plant, you have a pretty good idea. It might be a good reseeder. Um, uh, I have had troubles growing many types of Japanese maples. And, and you all know I have my struggles with roses. The banana was checked on yesterday. 
and it looks dormant. So let's call that good. It's not mushy or rotting, and that's all I really care about. Um, Sally, embrace the container. That's all you can do. I have never winter sowed a tomato, ever. Like I said, I don't have a lot of luck with tomatoes, or I mean, with winter sowing in general. So I've never winter sowed. You know, for me, tomatoes grow so quickly. They're one of the last things I grow start from seed. They grow so fast. I don't really feel like there's any thing to be gained by. I mean, they they're in my inside seed starting area for such a short period of time that I don't feel the need to to you know find someplace else to do that. Um, oh, rabbits, yeah, rabbits. They're terrible. Yes possibly worse disgusting for sure um yeah here this is katie and matt um yeah the prepping the bales is is the key so do check um katie and matt's suburban gardening couple they have a great instagram check them out i bet you can find some stuff about straw bales on there that from personal experience um i'm just kind of Is that the jumping worms that you're talking about? Yeah, they're not. So, I've heard that from plenty of people. Um, they're. Not, I, I'm afraid to go look. Honestly, I don't want to even look. It's it's so depressing. Bind weed is wretched. So I don't have it here. Well, I do actually have it in a couple of spots. I have brought it from a garden that I work on for our master gardener program. So we one of the gardens we do has a terrible bind weed problem. And I will say that over many years now, we have done glycosate with it, but mostly what we do is we hand pull it, but we don't just pull, we dig down. So because we have a large group of volunteers who work on that garden, the way we divide it is um, we all just take a, so we have like a big spring work day. And then after that, um, we have two people so every week we have two people assigned to the garden. So their job is deadheading and weeding and general sprucing and watering and all that stuff. So we divide and conquer that way. But one of the jobs is always to dig down and pull out all the bindweed. And over many years of staying on top of that, we have really, really, really managed it well there. But it's been years that we've been working at it. I have brought some home. I do have it in a few places. It's not a big enough deal here. I just do the digging and pulling out and I just know where I've got little spots of it. So I just keep an eye on it. I'm not sure if you mean if that was supposed to be hosta or that was supposed to be like host plants for, that's probably host plants for like insects. Yeah, but I don't know that I do it necessarily. I mean, it's not, I probably don't pick plants specifically for that purpose. But if I see that a plant will support um, a good insect, like to me, that's like, ooh, A plus. So it encouraged me to plant that more likely. But I don't know that I've ever gone like looking for a list and then planted because of that. Yulia and uh, Kate are just talking about cocktails. Um, yeah, the soft flies get hibiscus really bad. I would say, yeah, that's the right thing to do. Move them to sun because um, they'll be happier there anyway. And sun and moisture, those things want a lot of moisture. Uh, seascape, by far, by far. Buried treasures are very pretty strawberries. So, like, if you want to put them in, like, a container as, like, a cute little ad, do that. Otherwise, do seascapes because they're fab. Here we go. John, did you see this? There we go. Oh, this is even better. Look at this. Leave them in the ground. I think a lot of us are going to find that things that we, um, that things that we maybe accidentally leave out might make it. You know, I'm doing that. Yeah, I don't know if you guys saw this, but I left 
almost all my dahlias along the skinny little bed on the south side of the house in the ground this year. So far, they'll be totally fine. We'll see. I 50-50. I have been here for 21 years now. We moved here in 2000, June, like June 4th, maybe, of 2002 is when we moved in. And we've done a lot since then. Um, okay. Um, overgrown weeds. Um, so that's really, it's, it's a chance. Sometimes you look at this and you go, oh my God, what do we do? So I think first of all, take a look at what your weeds are. If it's a mishmash of various things, that's one thing. If it's a specific like invasive species that is overrunning the whole thing, you probably need to target what you need to do for that invasive species. So for instance, since I bring it up all the time, it's on my brain a little bit, uh, we've got across the street from us, we have this terrible thistle issue going on, on property that is not ours. And there is a um, herbicide that is specific to thistle that you can use. So if you had like a huge stand of one thing, just taking everything over, you may need to treat with a specific herbicide for that. And like for that, you would probably have to hire somebody. And maybe that's the best thing to do is hire somebody with an herbicide license who knows how to apply those things. You don't have to mess with it. You can start a strategy. If we're just talking general weeds, listen, I'm a full, I, smothering is a great way to do it. Um, newspaper, cardboard, great way to do it. Um, even better way to do it by, this is a study thing, is a six inch layer of arborous wood chips left on there for two years. Not for impatient gardeners, but it does work very, very, very well. Um, oh yeah, Zephyrine Duin, hang on, I missed that. But yes, it's Zeph, how do we pronounce that? Zephyrine Duin, Duin? Rose, that's the thornless one. And it's a great one, I've grown it before. And it actually did, it actually did well here. I wanted to address the viburnum that if you guys remember last year, I had this viburnum mercia, uh, mercia, uh, placat, viburnum placatum mercia, uh, and there was this chunk of it, it kept dying. Well, you know, I was going to dig it out or do something with it. I never fully diagnosed exactly what was going on with it. I didn't do anything with it. And you know what? The chunk that was there grew just fine. Didn't have nothing else grew back, but it's still there. I haven't done anything else with it. All my other viburnums, knock on wood, are doing great, except for, um, what kind of viburnum is it? I'm trying to think of the, um, which ones they are, but it's the glitter, it's the type that's the glitter and gold is one of the like proven winners varieties of it. Those, that type I'm not gonna grow anymore because viburnum beetle went nuts on it and ooh, that was disgusting. Um, here we go. Okay, I must have missed a question about dahlias in there, but Kelgi Ann was a great performer last year for me. I bought it last year from Dahlias by Julia, by Julie, Dahlias by Julia. I believe her sale is January 20th. Sign up for it. And then the way I got it last year was I went onto her website, picked out the varieties I wanted, made a list, went on there, set an alarm on my phone, went on there, the moment hit refresh, 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 like we used to do, we need to buy like concert tickets or something. Go on there, pick out your varieties, check out immediately. Don't let stuff sit in your cart. You can always come back and buy more. You'll have to pay a second shipping. Don't worry about it. It's worth it. So go through, grab the stuff you want, check out immediately. I was in and out in like two and a half minutes last year. And I think that's the only reason I got Kelgian. I have seen it in a couple other places. Check out the website dahliaattic.com if you are looking for a specific varieties. Some of the Dahlia sellers list their varieties there and you can go look. Some Dahlia sellers have stopped putting their stuff there because they are afraid they don't even have enough stock to even do that. And they just kind of want the people on their newsletter list to have first access. That's the other thing. When you start looking for Dahlias, sign, if you end up at one of these smaller growers, sign up for their newsletter um, that you, a lot of times they let you have first access or you know first when the sale is going to be. Um, I love this question. Um, I have, so basically I get my garden in a state where it's, it's set to go. 
I put in drip irrigation into the vegetable garden. So I don't have to worry about that stuff. Before I go on vacation, I pick every sweet pea, every vegetable that's like about to be ripe or ripe. Um, everything that I can, any flower that I know is not going, like every dahlia, if I'm gone during dahlia season, every dahlia that is there, because by the time I get home a week later, that will go, have gone over and it'll be mush. So you might as well use it. So I pick everything I can, give it away to neighbors, do whatever, give it to the dog sitter or the house, leave it in the house from the house sitter, whatever. And then I do have someone come to water my containers. So the only thing that's actively managed when I'm gone is the containers. However, this is why I don't start seeds. Uh, like for instance, I'm planning a little bit of travel this winter and I'm not starting seeds until after I'm home from those longer trips because it's, it's no, it, it, those things need daily management. So I'm not gonna hire, I'm not asking the dog sitter to take care of my seedlings cause that's too much, that's too hard. I knew someone was going to ask this. Um, just, we have, every time this, so Dorothy is our fourth Newfoundland. Every time we've lost a dog, I knew like immediately, like, oh, we'll get another one. Because it does work very well to have an older dog when you bring in a younger dog. Like, we didn't have to teach, I swear to God, we didn't have to teach Dorothy anything. She just was like, oh, this is how it works here. Thanks for letting me know. And then we went on with our lives and it was great. Um, with Odin, we, when we lost Odin, that was, we're still pretty broken up about it. There is really only one time of year that works for us to bring home a puppy. And that is fall. Um, we are gone too much during the summer to have one. I'm not super interested in house training during winter. And plus right after winter, we go into a busy summer, which means even if you've got a dog, that's like a puppy that's semi-trained puppies, you know, when they're six months old that's a that's a tough time so um fall is really when we when we would be if we do that it would be fall i i honestly i don't know i mean i i certainly watch the puppy videos and you know and i think about it a lot but it wouldn't happen we got time oh it was there you go kate asking about uh about Kalgan. okay let me just skip down here and make sure i haven't missed anything um i mean i'm sure i have Oh, that's so nice. Yeah, I think Crichton, I think Crichton Honey probably, oh, here it is again. If I had to pick one, like, like my all time favorite Dahlia, I think it'd probably be Crichton Honey just cause it is so, it's just so good. Somebody asked on there when I, um, <laughs> I'll tell you why I'm laughing right now. What Dahlias I'm on the hunt for this year. Um, I'm laughing because I almost showed you my phone, which currently has a picture of my credit card up on it. Okay, this is, here are some. That top one is called Pam Howden. Um, it's a water lily. That Kelge and Dahlia really got me into the water lilies big time. So I'm on the hunt for this one. I have already purchased Bloomquist Jean, three of them. I really like this Sweet Suzanne, although it's very reminiscent of Crichton Honey. So I don't know that I need it, but if I come across it, I will probably look for it. I already bought this one, Kamano Mordor. And I'm really kind of getting into these orchid types or well, I think that's what they call them. This one's called Tiffany Lynn. I haven't seen it anywhere, but maybe I'll pick up a different one. Uh, oh, and then this one, this is Holly Hill Pink Martini. And I've got a note there that it's at Triple Ren. Um, so I will maybe try to pick that one up from Triple Rent. I think that's another water lily farm. I told you I just, oh, Sandy Brocade. I've already bought that one here. These are the ones I've already ordered from various places. And I have not ordered from Longfield yet. Um, Sandy, San, it's Sandia Brocade. I ordered three of those. Camino Mordor, I ordered two of those. And then I've got three Bloomquist jeans coming. So those are the ones I've already ordered at different, at two different places. Um, Rivers Dahlias and Delightful Dahlias. I've never, it's the first time I've ordered from either one of those two places. So um, we'll see how that, how that works. Anyway, those are the ones that I've got on my, on my note on my phone here. Yeah. So Brampton Garden, 
Oh, we're going to talk about coneflower mites in a second too. Oh, hang on a second. We'll come back to that. Um, yeah, earwigs is gross. You know, earwigs actually are pretty good assassin bugs. They do take care of a lot of things, but they're, they are disgusting. You can do little earwig nests. You turn little mini ceramic pots upside down. You stick some hay in there and then stick them on a pole. And they like go in there and nestle in there. And then in the morning you shake them out. There's also a thing you can do with newspaper. Um, I don't blame you. They're gross. So calendula and tea. I don't know that I've ever tried that. That's interesting. Um, I do like calendula. It's, and I look at this leather calendula tea. Never done that. What's wrong with me? Coneflower mites. Somebody just asked me about this the other day and I wrote back to them on Instagram. There is, um, so there's a mite, oh gosh. Um, I'm not going to, I would look for the answer, but I'll never be able to find it. So the, but the way to deal with coneflower mites is, which is, now there's two things that happens. There's the aster yellows situation. And then there's a, it's a type of mite that starts with an E and I can't think of what it is, but uh, it's a um, rose, rosette, my, rose, no, it's just a rose mite. Something with a rose in the name often hits your coneflowers. So two separate things um, for the second one, which a lot of people mistake for aster's yellows. Uh, the trick is, so the treatment for that is horticultural oil applied before the buds break. So when there's buds, horticultural oil applied then. If there are still mites on them then, and really the only way to tell is if you get like, um, you know, you get there with a magnifying glass and you can see them on there, then that's when you go in there with a heavy hitter on that. And um, you have to look for one that will treat that type of mite. And I could not find an organic, pro I could not find like a bonide product um, that treated that specific kind of mite. So start with the horticultural oil and hope it works. Otherwise you got to kind of go into the heavy hitters on that. Yeah, this is, this is the issue, right? This is why for as warm as this winter is, we all get a little nervous because chill hours and that rest period are really important for plants. Um, so I'm glad you asked, Jen. Jen, it looks amazing. And that is the primary thing that I'm featuring in the uh, garden tour video that'll go up this week. No, this is a good point. I have no plans for new garden beds. And I would like very much to keep it that way. I am really on the edge of not being able to, of not being able to maintain this garden. Last year, I got everything in the ground and like all the new stuff I had bought, which was quite a lot last year again, in the ground and planted like July 14th. And I got to tell you, I don't want to be in that phase of gardening in July. June is fine because we can't plant a lot of things till June here anyway. I mean, perennials are fine, obviously, but um, June's fine. I don't want to be, I don't want to be frantically just jamming things in the ground before I walk out the door in for a vacation in July. So I'm, this is a year, my, somebody asked about goals. I don't have a lot of goals other than to not make any new gardens. I want to get to the, I'm sort of trying to phase out of the frantic planting portion of gardening. Now, this is why I say now it can all change when I see plants that I want. Trying to get away from the frantic planting part of gardening and get to the like perfecting areas part, like tweaking things, like looking at an area and being like, okay, I want to move things around and having the time to do it or dividing the plants that I do have. Um, to fill in an area near that and expand a little area. I want to get to that part of this garden instead of buying all the plants and plunking them in real quick. Because um, I'm sort of that, well, that's certainly fun. I love planting. Um, I'm finding more satisfaction now in sort of making the gardens that I have look better. Oh, yeah. I hold, I have, uh, I have five crates of dahlias in my basement right now, dahlia tubers in my basement right now. Probably when I divide them, it will be, well, I will give some away 
when I divide those dahlias, I'll have, I don't know, 200 probably, and I'm not growing that many. Oh, okay. So this is, so this is part of that Sandia series. I assume that's the breeder maybe. Thank you. That was sweet of you. Um, okay. Great question, Teresa. I don't have a great recommendation on this because I've never done the coral berry, although God, it's beautiful. And this is my first year growing berry poppins winter berry. Oh, and I also grow the berry heavy gold. Um, they were small plants put in the ground last May. Um, I will tell you this, the birds, you know, I planted, I'm planting those because I want them to, I want to use them for winter. Well, I want them to be pretty in winter, but I also want to use them in like winter displays. And the berries were stripped, the berries that they did have were stripped off those plants by before Thanksgiving, I think. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Restless Gardener. That is exactly what the E might, I was trying to think of was. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's tough. And the problem is once you have them, because Aster's Yellows are a mite that does carry them from plant to plant, once you have them, I think they run kind of kind of wild. I should do, you know, I would like to do that, actually. I would really like to do that. Um, okay, so uh, is this is not a, this is uh, a great idea. I don't know about an intern, but um, I do have a person who helps me in my garden. Um, she's been here for, I think this was her second or third year in the garden, uh, about five hours a week, which is obviously a, a scintilla of what is needed in this garden, but it sure helps me just stay. It helps me for two reasons. And I, by the way, she is amenable to be doing a video sometime. So sometime I'll, I'll do a video and we'll talk to her. Um, she's fascinating. She's an amazing gardener. She worked, she lived in Scotland for a while. So she volunteered with like, at some of like the Scotland, I don't know, castles or something, um, gardening there with a group there. She's incredibly talented. Um, she, she is, she is extraordinarily detailed, which is, couldn't be a better match for me because I am not detailed. She will, she will take a five foot patch of ground and she, that will be freaking perfect by the time she's done with it. So, you know, when I am, a, have a sort of have a propensity to rush through things and just like, cause the list is so long, she makes it right. <laughs> Um, but the other thing is that she is my sounding board in the garden. And I can't tell you how helpful that is. Like, for instance, here's an example. That path that we did last year um, with the stone steps, steps on it that we created that kind of heads over to the vegetable garden area. I, well, the way that path came to be was I had a large group of gardeners in my garden. And they were, it was a, a local gardening group made up of primarily um, older gardeners. Many of them took one look at the path I had there and they're like, no, thanks. I don't need to walk on that. It just looked so uninviting and so kind of rickety, which was just stones, just flagstones set in the ground that they said, nope, we're not going to go there. And I thought this, this is not good. If it doesn't look inviting, if no one wants to walk there, like that's not good. So this is where I bounced this off of Carol, who helps me in the garden, and asked her, you know, well, what do you think about this? And we sort of talked about changing the shape of the path, and I had never thought about doing that. And it was because she had been, and, and she knew that because she had been walking on that path and working in the garden. So she has much better perspective. So it's super, just that alone. If she did nothing but just give me her opinions as a sounding board, it would be helpful but she's amazing and i hope you meet her sometime um because she's a she's a huge help in many ways to me and it's a delight to have someone else there um i will just um say this quickly and i'll get some more comments in a second here which is um that the very best thing and this should be everyone's goal this should be i think i'm going to tell you you should have a gardening goal this year 
And your gardening goal should be to invite people into your garden this year. Because, and even better, if you can invite kind of like a lot of people at once and let them just kind of meander and then eavesdrop on them. I kind of got this from Christopher Lloyd because he talks about this in some of his books about how he over here, he would, he's such a, he was he's sort of a curmudgeonly voice a little bit. And so he would overhear people talking in the garden and, and he would, you know, he would just always kind of have funny comments about it. I have learned so much about how people look at my garden versus how I look at my garden. And in some cases you just say, okay, well, that's fine because it's my garden and all that really matters is what I think of it. But sometimes I get great ideas about things that would be better in this garden if I changed it because of something they said. Or if I see people recognizing a plant, I think, oh, well, maybe I should get like a lot of people saying the same thing about a plant. Like, isn't that cool? Like, maybe I should get more of that, or maybe I should place that in additional places if I have it in other places in the garden, but they didn't notice it. Or if there are plants that I think are spectacular, I'm like, why is no one noticing that like amazing clematis over there? I kind of take note and think, because it's out of the way. They aren't seeing it. So I've learned more from having people into my, I actually have learned more from having people into my garden than I have going into other people's gardens, but that's amazing too. So, um, hi, Jesse. Um, so, which I don't think is Jesse, uh, Jennifer. Um, so I still use these. They're, all, they're like attached to all my hoses. If you guys don't know what this is, this is a, it's a magnet. It's a big magnet that goes on your hose. Do not use it if you have a pacemaker. Um, that goes, it wraps around your hose. And the concept behind this is that it, it is pulling out some of the, you know, bad stuff in your water. Boy. And there's, listen, this is the problem with it. I don't talk about it much because I can't fully explain. I think this is beyond my scientific understanding. There's something about water molecules and whatever. Um, and the way I say that make that makes that sound very snake oily. So what I will say about the plant surge is that they actually bought them. I saw Bunny Guinness talk about them. I bought some and I did some experiments on my own. So basically the, the, the only experiment I ever truly did was that I was growing tomato seedlings. I had two trays of identical different seedlings and I watered one with water straight out of my hose and I watered well out of my hose downstairs and I watered the other one with water that was going through the plant surge and the plant surge ones were like twice the size which was enough for me to stick plant surges on every hose I have because my theory there was well it's certainly I think it's helping it's certainly not hurting and it's like a one-time thing buy it stick it on move on so that and that's sort of the extent of the experiments I've done. But a lot of other gardeners have been experimenting with it. I know Tanya at Lovely Greens absolutely loves them. There's a lot of other gardeners. And I know that it is in trials at the University of Georgia right now. So I'm sort of waiting to hear what they find there. But I think um, I think that is, I, I was being, I mean, I think it, like I said, it doesn't hurt. But you also, you shouldn't spend your money if it doesn't help. So I think... They'll be good once we get some university studies on that. Linda is here, but I didn't even see this. Um, this, okay, you guys, I don't, Linda, I don't know if Linda's still doing her blog, but it's called Each Little Wor World, and I think it's still out there, even if she's not actively posting to it now. Linda's Garden, which I know, which has been featured in multiple magazines, she's in Madison, is so inspirational to me. I can't even tell you how much inspiration I take from Linda's garden. It is stunning and it's uh, a lot of shade in it and it's interesting plants. She has a knack for finding amazing plants. So anyway, go check her out because it's amazing and it's really nice to see you, Linda. Happy New Year. Um, yeah, Black Eyed Susans. I've ripped out lots of Black Eyed Susans because they just go nuts. I, you know, here's the thing. I think they're easy enough to pull out that I keep planting them. Um, so I, 
yes, just keep pulling them on. I think you're doing the right thing. Um, no new beds this year. And probably not, I don't see myself transitioning to different kinds of plants other than what my what my tastes are dictating. I'm not making any sort of conscious effort to that. But um, listen, I appreciate a shrub. <laughs> not going to lie, I appreciate a shrub. I still have to really work on the shade garden portion of kind of the extension of the driveway garden. I did a little bit of that last year. I'm still going to focus on that this year. I really want to get that woodlandy shade garden going really well. Um, I am doing some, I will have a garden to show you, which is, that is not mine that I'm working on. And uh, it is going to be so good. It's on the lake and they are letting me pick out really good pots for it. So I am, uh, in fact, if I could figure out how to show you a picture, I could give you, um, let me just see, well, maybe do that at the end. I'll try to show you a picture of I don't know how I would do that, actually. I know there's a way to do that. Uh, maybe I'll, you know what I will do? I will post a photo in the um, community tab of YouTube so you can get a little idea of what, what I'm going to be working on, but it's, it's going to be fun. That's where I'm channeling a lot of this pent-up gardening desire is putting that into other gardens. Um, spotted lanternfly. Uh, it has not been spotted in Wisconsin yet. If it's been spotted in Illinois, I know it's been in Michigan. Let's assume it's going to be here. Spotter lanternfly is going to be a huge issue. It's terrible for crops. It's terrible for apples. It's really bad for um, vineyards. Not that we have a lot of those here. Uh, the only good thing about spotted lanternfly is that I think there's been a really, really, really good public information campaign about it, more so than almost any other insect that I can think of. So hopefully, even people who don't garden or don't know what it can do will recognize that and know that you squish them when you see them. And, you know, listen, there's always an invasive species around the corner. There's always something coming in and we just have to deal with them as best we can and adapt. And they all are terrible to manage and I hate it. But that's just, that's just how it works in this sort of, the way the world is now. I have no experience with those, Susan. Maybe if you guys have any comments on that, share those with Susan. Yeah, Wendy, um, see, that's, I, I'm hoping that um, when my winter berry gets a little older and has more on it, we'll see some more persistence. I may, I will probably try to find a spot to stick some coral berry in. Um, yep, exactly right. You know, so horticultural oil works by smothering them. So if they're a bug that can be smothered, the key with horticultural oil is applying at the right time. So I use horticultural oil on like my fruit trees. Um, and, uh, that can, you know, help smother the things and help a little bit, but it's, it's all about when you, when you put it on there. Highly recommend a carol in your life. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you're exactly right. That's exactly what I do. My, I, I can only be, I can only be so detail oriented and it's not like in my personal life. That's, that's not it. Although I do get very, um, I do get very projects that I am really into. I get very specific about, so I've really, well, I'm working on a, a website redesign right now, and I'm currently driving the person who's doing it absolutely insane because I am super fussy about uh, fonts and topography. Um, yeah, right. This is this is the thing. You know. I think this is such a good question because there's so many, you know, I look, I, I just, I feel like 
builders are doing no one any favors. I'm going to hide this so you can kind of see my face a little bit, but I feel like builders are not doing doing people any favors whatsoever with this. Um, they leave you with, they, they scrape off all the topsoil. They take that away. They leave you with utterly crap soil. They, sometimes if you have like a builder package, they'll put in some garbage landscape plants that you know they get in bulk they only know like four plants it's the same for everyone there's no shape to the beds it's straight lines around the thing and honestly by the time you're done building a house who i mean very few people unless you're really into gardening and and you know that going in very few people have money left at the end of a house build project to spend money on fixing all of those things i mean the ground is just crashed from machinery and topsoil being taken out. Um, so I think, you know, the thing with the suburban landscape situation is, first of all, I think almost in every case, throw some curves in there, get some curvy beds. I think one of the, one of the design things that, two of the design things that, that took me a long time to learn, but I think really are true is Bigger curves are better. Little little wavy curves um, never have the impact that a big curve will have. And the power of looking at, um, like for instance, out here, because I don't know how to describe this exactly, so I'm just going to tell you what it is. Out here, which is on sort of my side garden there, I have grass that is in a circle. And then the beds are whatever shape they are but they form around that. And there is, um, is that positive or negative? Whatever that is, you know, that, that solid circle of grass creates, obviously you've got your curves built into that, but it is a really dramatic statement. And so I think with a suburban garden, first of all, you're gonna have to spend a ton of time if it's a new build or it's never been amended, you're gonna have to fix the soil and it's worth spending the money to do that. And when it comes to design, Think about deeper beds. I mean, so many suburban gardens have four foot wide beds, deeper beds, big curves. If you can't think of what to do, think about making a big circle of grass and creating beds around it. Um, look for ways to have bold beds and then you can figure out what goes into them. I hope that helped. Um, you know, I love a hose link. Oh, fun. Oh, this is great. Okay, Sue, I want to hear more about what annual, what annuals you're going to be starting for other than Lysianthus. And I said this the other day on Instagram. I have nothing but respect for those of you who grow Lysianthus from seed because talk about patients I don't have, Lysianthus from, from seed. Mm -mm, takes too long. You got to start now? I, I can't. Um, I don't think that's crazy at all. I think that's wonderful. I think people would absolutely love that. I love that idea. There are so many good cosmos out there now. I grew kind of a little mini bed of zinnias and cosmos mixed together. There's so many good ones on there. Um, Rubinato is a dark one that's beautiful. Uh, there's all those lemonade, apricot, and there's one called apricotta. I don't know. There's, and the Sonata series is shorter, which is nice. I haven't, it is on the list for sure. Here, Katie and Matt say, go for it. Um, Joe... Lample has a really good podcast about this. You got to go through the archives and find it. He had a entomologist on who said that a lot of times this is not a good idea in particular when it comes to ladybugs because they are essentially illegally sourced and you release those ladybugs and for the most part they fly away within hours. So it, it was a really interesting podcast to listen to that was new information for me kind of changed my thoughts on that. It's really better to create 
a garden where these things happen naturally than to have to bring them in. And that's the only thing I've ever done. I've only ever purchased ladybugs. Um, and that was the end of that. <laughs> yeah, this must be about the uh, spotted lanternfly. Yeah. Oh, heck yeah. I'd love to come there. Absolutely. There's so many beautiful gardens out there. In fact, you know, I went to the garden fling this year. Um, and uh, this is a, it's going to be in a different part of Washington, but uh, I went to the garden fling this year and next year it's going to be in the Pacific Northwest. And I, I cannot go because it's at a time when I'm busy with something else, but like Dan Hinckley's garden is on it. Oh my God. Would love to go see Dan Hinckley's garden. There's other amazing gardens on it too. Oh, Oh my gosh, Marianne, I couldn't, couldn't tell you what a good time this is for this question. I have pictures to show you. So, um, I did a, you know, I started a ball blog this fall on top of the septic bed. So I did do that, but I wanted to show you, these pictures are kind of funky color, but I wanted to show you what I did at, well, this is at the same house where I'm going to be doing the new garden this year. This is picture isn't like the best, but that kind of brown area that you see there is the whole septic area. That whole bed we planted with, we planted with geranium macrorhizum. That's the fall, that's what it looks like right now. I took that picture yesterday or the day before. Got this gorgeous color on it. So the whole bed is covered in geranium macrorhizum and then we've put in a few small bulbs on it as well that come up through the geranium macrorhizum and it's been key. Now listen, there's all sorts of caveats about what you can do on septic mounds and septic fields and stuff. If you have any questions, you should definitely talk to your septic company because I don't want to mess up anyone's septic system. But generally speaking, if you've got something without invasive roots that will get huge and kind of shallow rooted, generally fine. Oh, listen, I think that's the standard. I see that everywhere. I mean, don't, don't we all see this everywhere? It's all, it's all bad. In fact, actually, two houses down, he spent a lot of money on a river birch. And I just walked by it the other day and I noticed that the, not only is the burlap on it, but it's tied around the trunk. And I'm like, okay, leave that, bur the burlap will figure itself out. I like to take it off personally. The burlap will figure itself out. I don't know about the cage that's under, if there's a cage on it or not, but I'm like, but you've got to just let me get in there and cut that twine off because that'll be dead in no time. Actually, it won't be dead in no time. And that's the worst part of it. It'll be dead in five years. And so now you put five years into this tree and then you think out of the blue, the tree just died. And it didn't die out of the blue. It's been dying the whole time because it was planted stupid. Yeah, it it's a real problem. I wish communities would, it's, a, it's an issue. I mean, it'd be nice if there were, you know, some more thought put into designing around some of the existing, you know, features that are there, but. Well, they probably were, that's not how they started to become a problem. They were, they know exactly where they came from, which is, um, I forget, ex well, they know, I can't remember right now, but it was, I mean, they came directly in shipments of stone, I think. Um, and that's how they got here. I do. I grow two of them. The one that gets more water is way happier than the other one. So keep that in mind. Yeah, I so I watched this. I I hope I hope this happens again. I was really intrigued by that. Um, I was really intrigued by that. Now those were, um, those were. What was it? Because those weren't like ladybugs and stuff like that. What was it that she, that she released there? Oh, it was nematodes, right? It was nematodes, I think. Um, I hope that keeps happening. I would love to see. I think it's really cool to watch how that works. I did not know. I knew know that dragonflies, uh, dragonfly larvae needs, like that's why plants like water iris and stuff are really good because dragonfly larvae need that. Yeah, right, Dawn? We, 
when we were planting our hornbeams along the back here, we dug a hole and I'm like, what is this? And it was a tree that had clearly been planted in exactly that area. Now, keep in mind, this was last year that we did this. So that was 20 years after we've lived in this house. It was not a tree that we planted. We pulled out a cage and burlap and twine entirely intact with the clay. I mean, just pulled the whole thing out of the ground. Nothing had broken down in 20 years. So that was, that was, I mean, I'd been taking burlap and cages off of trees for quite a while now, but that was the moment that I went never, ever, ever again will anything be left on because if that is still in the ground, I mean, the plant material, I guess there were some old dead roots that I could find in there, but the plant material was a little bit broken down, but the cage and the roots and the, and the uh, twine, I mean, and the burlap and the twine all still there. Um, predatory mites. Thank you, Sherry. Predatory mites is what uh, Laura and Aaron had um, had uh, used with that drone. I think it's super cool. I'd love. I'm really interested to see how that works, and interested to see if there are um, you know how that applies to other gardeners. Would you guys be interested in knowing? I placed my first seed order last night. Would you be interested in hearing what that was? It was from Select Seeds. It was a hundred dollars. <laughs> okay, here's what I ordered. Um, several nasturtiums, vintage, baby red, and baby orange. Um, cypress vine. Thank you, Matt Mattis, for that. Um, in white. There's a red and a pink color in that, too. Um, I did order a package of purple bell vine seeds. That's my favorite, Rhodochitin atrosanguinea. Um, I'm going to try the seeds again. I want to... By the way, I also bought plants because I've had way more success just buying the plants. I want to be able to grow those well from seed and be able to teach people how to grow those well from seed. It has been very spotty luck. So I'm going to keep trying, see how we do. Uh, Spanish flag, I guess we're, you guys know I love an annual vine. By the way, I tried shell vine last year. Never got a flower. Out it goes. Uh, Rubenenza Cosmos. I did buy uh, Dahlia seeds for a variety called, or for a series called, not a series, a collection called Sunny Reggae, which is kind of a collarette type. Uh, Mahogany Splendor uh, Hibiscus, which I tried growing last year and lost those seeds. I, I just think it's one of those things where, I don't know, I probably did something wrong. It, I don't think those are difficult to grow. Um, heirloom Mix Poppy, Hungarian Blue Poppy, Mark's Mix. Mark's Mix pos, a Hot Poppy. Say that one time fast. Um, Silene, uh, Sabella Carmine. Uh, raspberry Limeade Zinnia. And King Size Salmon Straw Flower. That's what was on my shopping list. Um, Jill, do I have... Here, let me put this up here so you can see this. Do I have insect hotels in my garden? I do not, but what I have is a ton of areas that are sort of used in that capacity. Keep in mind, I have this whole wooded area where nothing gets cleaned up. I have also started a dead hedge, which I have not shown you because it's kind of sad. Um, uh, oh, hang on. Oh, Because um, it's kind of sad looking right now, but I've started a little dead hedge. And your know, dead hedges are great for insects and critters and whatever. I also have about a million half dead trees out in that woods. So insects really love those. So, um, and you guys know that I don't clean up my garden until, until spring for the most part. So I think there's a lot of places for insects to be very happy in this garden. Um, oh, listen. Yeah, I don't blame you, Mary. I wonder what that's like to deal with that. Yeah, the lawn maintenance companies who, I mean, those guys are really good at mowing lawn. But they, whatever. I know there's nothing to be said about that. You know what I mean. I will start some of those inside. Most of those, the poppies will go straight outside. Poppies, I, yes, yeah, that is, I direct sow poppies. Um, sometimes I direct so zinnias. I have pretty good luck with that. Um, and direct so nasturtiums often. 
also inside, but I do that often outside. I don't bother doing that, nicking them. I do soak them for about three hours. And I feel like that helps. You know, Nister- they also they do fine even if you don't. But nasturtiums, which are these great big fat seeds, have such a hard seed coating on them. It's good to help them get a chance to get through that coating. Okay, Emma and Mary, I want to know what are the plants that the that the the lawn services come in and buy to do landscaping on people's gardens. I guarantee you, one of them is a spirea and a daylily. Just saying. Um, yes, I do. Here's how you start for ver- verbena bampton from seed. This is how it's worked best for me. I've had a few little ones grow. I believe it needs darkness. And I've had a, some success with that. The best way to do verbena bampton is to buy a plant of verbena bampton and then just let it go in your garden. And then you will have seeds everywhere. And I dig them up and I move them around. So I don't even bother trying to start it anymore. It reseeds so well for me. And it's very easy to spot because it's purple. So it's really easy to spot in the garden. And then I and it transplants perfectly. So if you can find a plant of it, just buy a plant for one year, stick it in your garden, and just let those seed, let it do its own thing, and you will have them the next year. I have had success starting from seed a couple of times, but it's like a percent, a small percentage of what I start is what is actually work for me. Yeah. Yep. Spirea. Potency. Oh yeah. Right. Um, all the ugly, yeah, all the ugly stuff. Yeah. That's, I'm not surprised. Um, Yeah, you know, I think some of those alliums are, I don't know which ones you planted. Some of those alliums are, have more longevity than others. Like Schubertii will grow for me for one year and then nothing. Christophii declines for me. I get about two years or three years out of it. And then I, I mean, I start to notice a pretty big, de- actually I notice a decline after the first year, but I just, some of those dishes I think aren't all that long lived. Um, so sometimes it depends on the variety and I think they're not all the same in terms of longevity. I get this question all the time and I have thought a lot about having a greenhouse and I don't want one. I, first of all, I don't have a good spot on this property to have one. I mean, there's no point in having a greenhouse, particularly up North, unless you've got a sunny spot to put it in. I don't have a lot of sunny spots to put things in anymore. Second of all, I don't really know exactly. First of all, I'm only interested in a greenhouse that would be a like hands-on, hardworking greenhouse. Um, I don't really need another. I mean, I, I love beautiful greenhouses. Don't get me wrong. Dawn Seasonal Designs has a gorgeous greenhouse. Laura Garden Answer, obviously, gorgeous greenhouse. Um, Laura at um, um, How's It Growing, New Jersey, beautiful greenhouse. They're all beautiful. I only would be interested in a greenhouse that I was actively growing in. I feel like um, in winter, if I was trying to overwinter some of my tropicals in there, the heating bill would be exorbitant. Um, I feel like in summer, I wouldn't use it. In spring and fall, would definitely, you know, in winter, I'd love to be able to grow some greens in it, things like that. That would be great. I just feel like I could never even if I could find a place to put it, I don't think I would justify the expense of having it. And I feel like there are other ways to accomplish what I would want to be doing anyway. I would, I am the, I would tell you this, the next thing I would like to do in this garden is I would like some really cool cold frames. Um, I'm trying to figure out where that would be. That's my biggest problem. Um, design is not so hard. Get some windows. I would like to make some with glass with some windows and everything. Um, uh, that would be that's kind of the next thing i'd like to do and actually ideally i would make really deep cold frames i would love to move my like when i put my dahlias outside after they sprout in those temporary greenhouses i'd love to be able to just do that in really deep cold frames um i don't know if that takes up a lot of room so i don't know i i don't love those temporary greenhouses they do what they need to do but damn those are ugly they are ugly so
Um, yeah. Okay. So this is a question that I think a lot of people have, um, you know, with things that are popping up, a lot of people, a lot of people are having warmer than normal. Weather. There's, there's almost nothing you can do. Um, if you live somewhere where this is a cold snap, you know, you can protect plants through a cold snap. Um, but now with this unusually warm winter, and I think uh, Midwesterners are predisposed to thinking if it's warm now, it's going to be terrible soon, which we don't know. Obviously, there's no evidence of that happening, but we've been burned by it so many times we don't allow ourselves to think that the good times will continue. Um, just trust the plants. There's nothing, there's nothing you can do. Um, most plants are very adaptable. They are much tougher than we think they are. Um, the only thing you can do is throw extra mulch on stuff. If you're really worried about a specific plant, throw some extra leaves, or cage it and throw a bunch of leaves in there, throw some extra mulch on it. That's the only thing you could do. Other than that, it's, it's not up to us. <laughs> it's true. That's true. My parents had some enormous ones that the deer do not eat. Oh, that's quite interesting. Yeah, see, that's quite interesting. Um, yes, we have some windows in our garage that have been hanging on to for far too long in hopes of making them into cold frames as well. In fact, the neighbor who's doing all the construction next door, I saw them the other day. They took out this absolutely glorious window. It was probably eight feet across. And then they threw it in the dumpster and broke it. And I'm like, oh my God, that would have been perfect for somebody's greenhouse or a cold frame. I'm like, oh my God, these people who build these great homemade greenhouses would die for that window. And you just threw it in and I just watched this machine throw it in a dumpster. I'm like, oh, I mean, it's hard to do that stuff. I get it. But oh my gosh, that was sad. Um. Yeah, I'm really bummed. So bummed they didn't plant some carrots in fall. I'm so mad at myself for not doing that. Um, so this is in your garden for direct sowing. So um, yeah, you have to have, um, you gotta have a little bit of loose soil in the top there. So you can scratch, if you're planting, if you're planting seedlings into it or you're planting um, sowing seeds directly in it. Either way, you got to make that top bit of soil at least nice and soft. Um, so that might be, you know, scraping it up. Uh, if your soil is perpetually hard, you might, you know, mean a little bit of soil amending, um, leaf mold or compost would probably be good. Um, like discolored, like brown discolored. That could be like too much water maybe or something. I don't know. That's interesting. You guys weigh in on that for Anita. Oh, see, you're all trying to talk me in and tell me that I need a greenhouse. 100% uh, true, Lynn. Climbing hydrangeas are an exercise in patience. Dutchman's pipe will grow in some shade um now that's an annual though so you're probably thinking like perennial i mean boston ivy that'll grow in shade um if you're thinking perennial type of climbers um there's lots of annual climbers that you can push into into shade acerina um would be one of them um and dutchman's pipe would be one of them they won't flower as well obviously but they'll they'll grow um i'm sure there are other oh um chocolate vine i think that's an annual too but yes yeah, sir you have other options i do not have a green stock um i am always intrigued by them but i have never tried them i don't actually know where i would put one so that's part of my problem I certainly see people being awfully productive with them though. So they, they look, I mean, there's something there for sure. If you want to grow vegetables and you've got like a balcony garden or something like that, I'd do a green stock any day.
Oh, well, there you go. There we go. Oh, hang on. Um, yes, the other person to check out for amaryllis tips is Danielle at North Lawn Flower Farm. She has potentially uh, amaryllis obsession that might need some assistance. <laughs> she has a lot of amaryllis. Um, I am not on the water. We're like 500 feet or so from from the water. So there is a row of houses between between us and the water. Okay, here's what I like to do when you've got like a pergola that you have to deal with. Annual vines. So plant your perennial, plant your new climbing rose or a new clematis or whatever you like. And then plant annual vines there as well, because those annual vines will take care of you for a year until that other one really gets going. And if you need them the second year, you can always do that. So, um, um, so that's the way I always go. Anytime I'm planting something, I almost always plant an annual vine next to it. Um, there are so many great annual vines. I'm a little bit obsessed with them. Purple, um, what is it guys ruby moon hyacinth bean purple hyacinth bean uh you can't go wrong with it grows amazing absolutely gorgeous will fill up a trellis there's other things that you can there's so many great annual vines so that's what i would do is um is plant whatever you want as a perennial there and then also look to annual vines for a year or two while the other things get established that's why i love annual vines so much because they um, uh, they just they grow like a foot in a day. It's great. Um, it makes you feel really good. <laughs> oh, I feel great about mountain mint. I love mountain mint. I love it. I was just looking at it the other day um, by the side where I have it in the um, driveway garden. It looks so pretty right now. It's so beautiful in winter. Um, yes, it takes up an area. It, does not, it has not been aggressive for me at all. It just fills up an area. So I, I feel perfectly comfortable recommending it to anyone and planting it. You just got to make sure you're planning on giving it enough room. And it's like the best pollinator plant out there, or certainly one of them. Yeah, I'm excited. I've never done it before, and that's why I got those seeds. I'm looking forward to that. Um, has it reseeded for you? How interesting. I don't know that I've ever left the seeds there long enough for them to, to fall. I often pick them because they're so pretty in arrangements. Yep, exactly, mountain mint. And I have um, the blunt mountain mint, Pygnanthemum muticum. There is a narrow relief one as, as well. Um, Kathy, I have so many annual vines that I love. Um, it's hard for me to even think of them all. Obviously, sweet peas. Um, all those can be a little bit seasonal. Um, purple hyacinth bean. Um, that cypress vine. Actually, you know what you should do is go to um, uh, Matt Mattis, his website, Growing With Plants. He has a whole, he's kind of special. He loves them too. In fact, I talk to him often about, hey, what what new annual vines should I be trying? Because it's kind of my goal to try them all at some point because that's how much I love them. So he's got some great, great pictures and great advice on how to grow them. Uh, that's Danielle, and she's her YouTube channel is North Lawn Flower Farm. Oh, thank you for bringing this up. You're fully deer resistant. No joke. It smells. So pretty much smelly plants they won't they won't go near um probably seven zone seven i think i mean zone seven minus snakes i bet it'd be easy i've never tried it i always bought from plants i bet it would not be difficult i think it'd be definitely be worth a try I can try. 
I will do that. And I will, when I post this, I will try to do that. Oh, yeah, that's not great. The mice problem. But yes, um, and it's great. It's, you know, actually, we planted a purple hyacinth bean um, this year when the neighbor was doing all their, is still doing all their construction. But when they put the porta potty, like, literally like 10 feet from our garage i'm like i do not want to look at the porta potty if all the things we're going to look at can it not be the porta potty so i stuck an old trellis that i had in the ground stuck a purple hyacinth bean that i started from seed you can stick them straight in the ground too but you get them going earlier if you start them inside they grow so easy they're a bean planted one of those on there covered it up and then they moved the porta potty but it looked great Actually, it grew up into the uh, um, cedar tree that was above it, and it looked really cool with those purple flowers going into the cedar tree. Scarlet runner bean, fabulous suggestion. This is what we're going to work on. We're it's a challenge. I've had modest success with it. Um, start them very early, and sow them on the surface. And like, don't even like cover, you know, no covering, just keep them surface sewed and make sure they got good contact with the soil. Keep them warm. That's the best thing I can, I can tell you. Blonde ambition grass, uh, blue grama grass. It, what is it? Uh, oh, I cannot think of the uh, botanical name right now. Um, is Primo. Unfortunately, it hadn't. I planted a lot of it out by the road and it didn't do great for me. I think it was too dry there. Um, I will try again in a little bit warmer. I mean, some of them are still there, but I think it just needed more moisture than I was able to give it. And that's pretty sandy soil out there. Um, yeah. Um, do I have a favorite? I have a few of them in the garden. I don't think I have a favorite. I sort of like them, like them equally. Um, blue glitter is, is a real good one. Though, I'll say that. I do not, if you're talking about the purple hyacinth bean, I do not grow them in advance. Well, hey, Vale Creek Cottage in Australia. Happy New Year. It's probably almost the day after New Year's Day there. I hope, I always love seeing the fireworks in sydney it's always nice when you guys go first for us and check that out i was in new zealand for new year's eve in the year 2000 so that was a pretty cool new year's eve to be there for when we i was like i called i called everybody back home i'm like hey happy new year and they're like what are you talking about i'm like because it's like 16 hours ahead there it was great i said don't worry everything went fine because that was the you're old enough to remember the whole Y2K thing. Um, it's a good question. I think the Northwest Flower Show is is quite a good one because I think that's the one out in, that's in February. I think that's a very good one because I feel like there's really an emphasis on plants there. I went to the Philadelphia Flower Show once and I, I enjoyed it, but I didn't find it to be particularly helpful to me as a gardener because some of the displays were so, I mean, they're not, you, they were, they put together plants that you would never see together. And I didn't find that to be particularly helpful to me. Um, I've not been to that uh, Northwest flower show, but um, I know some of the, some of the talks that are there. Um, also, you know, like we have, um, garden expo in madison is by us and that is really heavy on seminars and that's a really good one because there's some great seminars happening there and they're all kind of in one place and i find that to be more helpful than a bunch of garden displays and of course there's booths and everything too but there's no like fake gardens which is kind of nice thank you very much bet you look Gracilius, Blonde Ambition. No, Hackle and Chloe needs no special attention. No, it wants, it wants like even moisture. Um, 
you think Japanese forest floor. That's what you need to think of when you think of Hakalakloa. It wants even moisture, but even in some of my sandier soil, it does just fine. Um, I cut it back in spring and I cut it back. In fact, that's going to be in the garden tour too, because it's looking primo. It looks so good right now. Um, I take the weed whacker to it. And I weed whack the whole thing because there's a lot of it. So I just weed and I do it in chunks. So like I'll weed whack from the top. So everything gets chunked into mate like into like maybe six inch chunks and I just let it lay there. It looks messy as heck for like a month until things get covered up. But that's what I've been doing for years and seems very happy there. There, perfect. That's great. Yep. Yeah, and Longwood is you can't really go wrong with a trip to Longwood no matter what. You guys, I have so many gardens that I want to visit and the postcards have made that problem, that list way longer. Um, all these postcards that people have been sending in. Um, I have a whole stack. I'm not going to get to them today. I brought them in case in case we had a lull in the conversation. We'll just do a video on those. Uh, big shout out to Katie and Matt for this stack right here. So if you sent a postcard and I haven't read it yet, here's why. Um, I got a postcard, picked up some mail the other day, and there was a postcard in there from Katie and Matt's Sperm Garden Couple. They said, this is the second time we've sent a postcard. Hope this one gets to you. And I went, I'm pretty sure I'm caught up other than this, you know, other than maybe like the past few weeks. I'm like, hmm, what's going on here? And I started looking around and I found a stack of postcards in a little envelope put on the desk that I use downstairs to organize all the electronic equipment. And I look through and I'm like, there are unopened envelopes and postcards in here. And not to blame anyone, but I'm definitely going to blame Mr. Much More Patient for that because uh, he definitely stuck those in a random envelope and that's why they got lost. I have found them. So we're going to read all those. I feel terrible about it. But anyway, if you're not, not in on the loop on the postcard pro project, then about a year now, right? Um, I've been asking people to send a postcard um, or card, whatever, from a, with an information on like what they saw that inspired them in a garden. And so many people have been sending postcards from the most amazing gardens around the world. And I, I want to see them all. I, I would love to just do like garden travel. I will say, so bucket list stuff, a trip to England needs to happen. Um, I need to, I mean, there are private gardens there that I want to see. There are garden friends I would like to visit there. Um, obviously, I mean, Great Dixter is is right at the top of my list. I would like to, um, I, what I would like to do there is take one of their symposiums. So I'm kind of holding off on that until I'm able to do one of their symposiums. I am doing their online symposium, by the way. If anyone's doing that, um, there isn't like a six- five or six month online symposium that they're doing this year for the first time, which kind of mimics the stuff they cover in those symposiums that they do in person. I've taken a whole bunch of um, like Fergus's webinars and stuff. And I, I wrote to the folks over at Great Dixter and I asked them, they said, well, there'd be some of that, but this is really going to be more advanced and there's lives. So we're going to be able to ask Fergus questions. And anyway, I'm taking that it starts in January. You might still be able to sign up. I don't know, but that's at the top of the list, but listen, the list is, is so, so, so long. Honestly, every garden is worth visiting for the most part. Um, yeah, like Dawn said, it's like a month long trip. I don't think I'll ever be able to get away for a month at a time, but also there are garden friends who are running, like Marianne Wilburn is doing tours now. Um, so and I wanted to badly to go on one. Um, actually, Leslie Harris does the podcast, Into the Garden with Leslie. She's going on that one. I wish I could have made that done. It's just the, the time of year is, there are certain things that happen for me at certain times of the year, and that just makes travel a challenge. I mean, that wouldn't be the worst, right? There you go. They have a great volunteer program there. Oh. This is funny, Amy, that you bring this up. Actually, they're already out there. I'll probably do a video. Um, you can like you can look up proven winners plants of the year, and a lot of those things are set 
a while ago. Uh, National Garden Bureau always does like a of the year program and they don't pick specific plants, but they pick like salvia is the perennial year or whatever kind of general categories. I just did. Um, and I think I'll put this, I don't, you know, I write a weekly garden column for a newspaper and I don't often, you don't see, you never see those, but the one I wrote this past week, which was about the color of the year and how that translates to the garden. And then my pick for what I think the garden color of the year is going to be is going in this week's paper. I think I'll probably put a version of that post up on the, up on the blog. I am thinking about, I'd love some feedback on this. I am thinking about if I ever start some sort of like membership program, um, like a Patreon type thing. I was kind of thinking that like one of the things, cause I won't do that until there's enough benefits for people to get from it and that I know I can deliver. So I won't, that's what, the, that's why I haven't done that sooner. But I did think that one of the things I might do for that is just, um, you know, every week people would see my weekly garden column. I, it wouldn't always be applicable because sometimes they're very local, but see my weekly garden column as one of the, one of the things there. Um, do it. I mean, I, some people use these roller bins and they like them. Julia, do you use one of those? Um, and I think that's a, certainly a great way to do it, but even just like a tiny little, if you can find a little corner to put it in, it doesn't take much space, um, or compost directly into the garden. This is the other thing that I see people do. And I think it's a really good way to do it. Dig a hole in a space in your garden, put your kitchen scraps in there, close it up, move on, go to a different spot. Um, Yeah, this is, you should contact, you should contact the people who organize that, find out who that is and tell them, hey, come over, check out my garden. I think you, you know, I'd love to have it here. And they'll tell you if, if you know, they'll, they'll certainly keep you on for another year. Most garden tours are always looking for somebody to be on them. So you should contact those people. And then the only thing I would say is, um, first of all, recognize it's really, really, really scary and nerve wracking to put your garden on a garden tour. I freak out every time. Um, it's very, you're, it's like, oh, it's very, very personal thing. And I would say, um, try not to lose your mind. Don't, as much as you take from people in terms of what they say, just keep remembering. Like if someone says something that's really not nice, just remember, it doesn't matter because they don't live there. It's your garden. And so it should, you are showing them your garden and what you like. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about what people say. Ideally, they will, more than likely, they will be amazed by your garden and you will get great ideas from them. But don't be afraid of if there is any bad comments because it doesn't matter. It's all, it's all you. Just keep, and then the other thing I would say is, if you're going to have your garden on a garden tour, I find it to be very helpful to have a little stockpile of plants. This year, I found, I ran into that great sale at the local garden center where they had a cartload for 60 bucks. And so I filled in a whole bunch of holes. Um, if it was in spring, I would like to have some like annuals grown from seed to plunk in some holes. It's nice to be able to fill a hole. Um, doesn't have to be anything permanent. That's kind of one of the things that I, I like to do. Yep, rolling bin. There you go. Um, I can, but I will tell you right now that I grew one last year called Lakeview Peach Fuzz, which is quite charming. And that certainly falls under that category, doesn't it? I mean, also, I would say Crichton Honey certainly falls under that peach category. There's um, Jowy, one of the Jowies. I'm not sure if it's Nikki or the other one. There's kind of a peach. There's all sorts of them. Here, this is Yulia talking about the tumbler. Best in sunny spots, and it gets heavy to turn if you're not fit. Thank you for sharing that. Yes, Don also hit up the uh, Don also hit up the cartload for sixty bucks sale at Bayside Garden Center last year. And I guess Anita went there too, or maybe you saw it. Maybe you just saw it, Anita. God, I hope that happens again. Yeah, this is this is the thing. Always remember this. You, I feel like, especially if you're a person who gardens kind of alone, the only 
person whose opinion matters is yours. Like, and how many other places are you allowed to make whatever you want with no one else telling you what, what should be there? Like not even in your house. If you live with someone else in your house, like there's usually another person who has some say about it. Right. But if you're a person who does most of the gardening or you have a, a partner who doesn't care as long as it looks nice, like there are very few places in this world where we get to just make it our very very own and that's what it should be regardless of what anyone else thinks and that's the beautiful thing with gardens i can walk into a garden that is totally not my style nothing i would ever do and absolutely appreciate it for for being a beautiful garden and a representation of the gardener that was my big i kind of went off on that a little bit last year um i when i went to that trip to philadelphia last year that's what I loved about those gardener gardens is that each garden was individual. It told me something about the gardener who did it. I'm getting super frustrated personally with gardens that look real cookie cutter. Um, I see a lot of, I think inspiration is great. I love inspiration. Everything I do is inspired by, I, I bet you everything I've done here is inspired by another garden I've seen somewhere. Um, I don't know that I've ever had a truly is there even an original idea in gardening? I don't know that there is. If there is, it's not coming from me. Everything is inspired from something else, but it's always my personal spin on it. I see, even like locally, but online, I see a lot of gardens that are being picked up directly from other gardens. Like, oh, this is exactly what I want. This is exactly what I'm doing. And I wish people would say, I love that. I want that and say, this is how I'm going to change it up because it's even better for me. I was a little bit of a rant, but it's my, it's my, my, you know, plea to, to make your garden your own and you will love it so much more. Uh, absolutely. Faye, I want to do this. This is the other thing. Like we do like a, if I made some kind of like gardening friends group, first of all, I would probably offer opportunities. It's not, we're not, we're in the middle of not, a place where a lot of people go but i would probably open up the garden at least once if not a couple of times a year to like a group um but also meet in other gardens for sure my neighbors have absolutely made comments on what i should do and i laugh about them i love my neighbors but i do laugh when they have ideas about what i should do on the garden Yeah, right, Don. This is it. This this is the other thing. I am way more comfortable with a tour coming that is made up of gardeners than I am of like potentially non gardeners, because gardeners know that weeds happen. They know that empty spaces in your garden happen. By the way, Don, can I say what tour you're going to be on this year? I don't want. Maybe I'll wait till Don tells me if I can mention it or not, because Don's going to be on a big garden tour this year. Um, but the point is, is that gardeners are very, they understand that like, or if it's a terrible year, it's probably a terrible year, year of their garden too. So they understand, oh, it's a drought. Oh, that's nice. Thank you, Patty. That's really sweet. <laughs> and this is super, super true. Um, I like this question. I used to, here's how I used to approach my garden. I used to be like, okay, everything needs to be weeded. So I would go through and I would weed the whole garden. And then by the time I got back to where I started from, all the weeds had regrown, the garden still looked terrible, nothing was done. So now what I do is I, I batch projects by the garden. So I will weed, I will try to divide, if I have to plant anything, edge. I'll try to do all of that in one garden area before I move on to the next. And I typically start closest to the house in the gardens that I see or walk through the most. Um, because that way at least something's done and something looks good and that gives me satisfaction. Oh, Dawn says yes. Dawn is going to be on the Garden Conservancy tour. Garden, Dawn's garden is in Fredonia, Wisconsin. And she is going to be on the Garden Conservancy tour. I don't know what month you're going to be on, but um, 
if you are a member of the Garden Conservancy or you pay attention to their tour cattle, uh, calendar, look for her there this coming year. I'm already nervous. <laughs> I'm nervous for Dawn. Not that she's anything to be nervous about because her garden is amazing. It's just that garden tours are nerve wracking. And a lot of people, if you're on the Garden Conservancy tour, a lot of people come through. Well, this is a good question. Yeah, there are definitely ways to get um, movement in a garden, um, which I think is really important, but not have it be quite you know, as um, free-flowing, perhaps, as some other ones. I, ornamental grasses are available in, you know, you can get an ornamental grass that's very upright, like uh, Carl Forrester, Calamagratus, um, something like that. That will give you great movement, but there's something that's very neat and tidy about that very upright form. So I think ornamental grasses like that can be really good. Um, there are some shrubby willows that I think are very pretty and you can keep them, you know, a little bit in check. Uh, I think that would be, um, I think that would be really a nice thing to kind of move in there too. Um, just think about that. I, I would say, think about the contrast of texture more than anything. And I think if you bring in enough bold texture in some places, you that will bring in um that will create a little bit maybe more neatness that you might be looking for and then add in some of that feathery texture um and then dot in some and maybe you want to do more than you know um like a, instead of like a matrix type planting maybe you want to do you know more bold sort of swaths of plants which can create a little bit more um, um tidiness isn't exactly the right word but i think you understand what i'm saying Yeah, arborist chips, they are the key. You can get arborist chips. Um, let's see, I saw something really funny in here. Here we go. Dawn says August 11th and 12th. Um, my favorite basil. Everleaf Emerald Towers basil has done better for me and produced better for me than any other basil I've tried, and I will keep trying them. But... Um, that is that is the best one oh, i don't know what's happening there um yeah dawn does have a youtube channel right dawn seasonal designs it's also on instagram um okay Oh, okay. Here's what, can I get some feedback from you guys real quick? Merch, not just merch, products. I'm working on it. I know I've been saying that for, I probably said that in last year's live, but like literally it's being worked on now. Um, my thought is, well, first of all, I said I'd talk to you about this mug. Have I talked to you about these mugs before? This is the Great Dixter mug. You can't buy this. You, you can buy this at the Great Dixter shop, but you can't ship it from there. In addition to the fact that it says the Great Dixter thing, and actually I have two of the same ones. One of them was a gift from Fergus when he came here. So that one's like extra special, but it's my favorite mug because it's bone china. I love the size of it. I like a smaller cup because I hate it when coffee gets cold or something. So I have found these. If anyone steals this idea, does this before me, you're gonna be on my naughty list. I have found these. I'm hoping to do a series of like custom mugs. It's one thing. Second of all, second of all, um, shirts, t-shirts, sweatshirts, stuff like that. I'm going to do a handful of those, some like basic logo stuff, maybe some that are a little bit different. If you have thoughts on the kind of things you would like to see, let me know. That stuff will get launched first. That's kind of going to happen along with a new website or very shortly thereafter. I think we were going to get that ready for Christmas. Um, okay, wine glasses. Like the idea. I'd love to do, actually, I love my little, like, Yeti tumbler, uh, wine tumbler. Ooh, a tech shirt. Interesting. Okay. That's great. 
Barbara says, when are you coming back to Longwood so we can go on a cocktail tour? I don't know, but you, you piqued my interest. Um, T-shirts and wine glasses. Okay, lots of wine glasses. Favorite tomato off the top of my head, Firebird Dwarf Tomato. Favorite trees for all season interest. I don't know. Let me think about that for a little bit. Um, yeah, laser etch. Okay, good. A lot of people are interested in mugs. That's great to know. Um, all right, good. A lot of people like to do that. Extra stuff. Okay, good. Thank you. Keep the, you can feel free to share those comments with me. I appreciate that. Um, my God, it's almost been two hours. This was not supposed to be two hours, but I do love talking to you guys. So we probably should be this more often. Do weekends work for that for you guys in general? If we would do, make this like, you know, like a once a month thing or something, um, let me know. T-shirts without giant logos on the front. Yeah, I agree. I don't, I mean, I have a couple. But mostly I like a small logo and if anything, something on the back. That's sort of what I often wear. Hydro flask water bottles. Gosh. What plants would you like to grow if you were in a warmer southern climate? Dervilla. Dervilla? Is that what it is? I say dire dire no, it's not Dervilla. It's I grow Dervilla. It's a dire dire diorama. It's not diorama. But it's something like that. Someone's going to tell me what it is because I say this every time. I still want to grow this plant. Um, hold on. Angel's fishing rod is the common name for it. Yeah, it's di it is diorama. D-I-E-R-A-M-A. -A. I love plants like that so much. I love... I mean, that's why I love some of those thelictrums that they that they run over um, and just kind of flop over a garden and move around. I love those. I, I've looked into it. There's no way I could grow here. It would never, it would not grow here. I have, I'm happy to push the envelope. That is an envelope that I'm not going to bother with because I just don't think it's, I just don't think it's possible. Oh, Camellia. Yeah, Camellia. God, they're gorgeous. They're really gorgeous. In fact, um, if you guys watch the Proven Winners Color Choice uh, Shrub thing, um, see, this is why we should end this before two hours because I'm losing my brain. Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs podcast or radio show that they do every week. I just watched it. If you watch it on YouTube, you see pictures and stuff. They have a new camellia out there and uh, it's red tip something or another. It's hardy to zone 6b so i can't do that but boy it'd be great it's beautiful fast ground cover okay careful with your fast ground covers because if they're super fast they're probably invasive so do a lot of research before you pick a ground cover based on how fast it grows lamium is a good one though if in my area not invasive definitely invasive in some places so be careful when you look for fast growing ground, ground covers um that's a good one i'm just looking at it right now and it looks really good right now so that's great oh thank you you guys are so good that you remember the things that i my brain is not good um i would say you guys i don't do gardening journals i check out linda vodder she's got this five-year one out um, I think that's probably, I have not personally seen it because I just am not a garden journal person. Um, but I think it looks, I've seen the layout of the pages and stuff. I think it looks really good. So if you're looking for a garden journal, um, look there, see what I can find for you. It was like, if you go to the, if you go to the gardening simplified show, thank you very much for that, Lily. Uh, Proven Winners, Camellia. It's a hybrid. Just Chill Red Tip is the name of it. It has beautiful red new foliage on it. The flowers are pink. Um, Dragon's Blood Sedum. There's one option. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, here you go. A nightmare. So do, do be careful. Do I would say when you're looking at plants, research ground covers the most because they are very specific to the area you live in. What 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 is perfectly manageable here could be a major regret in your area. Okay, I'll answer this question. I'll answer this question one more time. Benjamin Moore Summer Nights is the blue color. The the white, which is looks yellow here, is Marscapone by Benjamin Moore. All right. This was great. You guys are all wonderful. Thank you so much for coming and talking to me. I apologize that I kind of went a little dark there in December. I think I kind of do it every year, but I don't mean to. Um, it was a nice little break, honestly. I didn't intend on taking it. It just happened because things got busy. But I am super pumped up and ready for some great videos and great gardening and all sorts of good stuff um, to come. So um, this will be available as uh, I'll keep this up on YouTube. You can revisit it. Lord knows if you want to hang in there for this long on the replay. God bless you. <laughs> all right. You guys have an absolutely fabulous day. Enjoy your New Year's Day. Happy New Year to everyone. Um, as always, I appreciate you all so much. You are all phenomenal. And um, I just, I can't thank you enough for being part of such a great um, gardening community. Thank you so much. Have a great day, everyone. We'll talk soon. If you got any questions that I didn't come to, feel free to drop me a message. Instagram is often the best place to catch me. That's where I can reply the quickest, often with a voice memo. So if I missed your question, um, hit me up there. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Bye-bye.